Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff. Welcome to this at-home Ash Wednesday experience. Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of the season of Lent in the church calendar, in the church year. That's 40 days uh, that take us along the journey uh, to the cross, ultimately. Uh, Lent is a penitential season. It's kind of uh, dark and gritty. It's a time for Christians to uh, examine their own sin and focus on their Savior. This year we're going to do that by focusing on the last words of Jesus. Each week, a different final word from the cross from Jesus. When you say goodbye to somebody, or especially if you've lost a loved one, you really pay attention to the last words that they speak. You remember them. You hold on to those words. And so we're going to do that with Jesus in this particular moment in our lives. We're going to focus on those final words of Jesus from the cross, meditate on them, take them to heart, and let them transform us and give us hope. Uh, we do this in a series called It Is Finished, uh, the last word of Jesus from the cross, a word of certainty that he has overcome the grave, sin, and death. And we begin with Ash Wednesday and this at-home experience. One thing that we do in worship uh, in church or even in your home is light a candle. And I would invite you to do that right now. If you have a candle somewhere in your house, if you would get it now, you can pause this video, uh, get a match or a lighter and a candle, and use the candle as, a, as an item to uh, mark a space and a time as sacred and holy, to set aside this time. And uh, light helps us do that. It reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world. So at this time, take your candle, light the candle, marking this time and this space as sacred and remembering that Jesus is our light, light in darkness. We begin our worship with God's name. You can even make his name uh, on your body, making the sign of the cross, remembering the cross in your life and his name placed on you. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Return to the Lord, your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. We come to a time of confession. Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of this season of Lent. It is an honest and sober and raw season. It is a season of repentance, which means to turn, to turn away from our fatal, sinful ways and to turn toward our Savior our merciful God. And so I invite you uh, to confess your sins with me. We confess. Merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. We repent in ashes, but we rejoice in Jesus our Savior. I have the privilege of sharing this good news with you, that your sins are forgiven, that Almighty God in His mercy has not left you in your sin, but He sent His Son to die in your place and for your sins, to forgive them, to wipe them all away. And so, as a called and ordained servant of the Word, by His authority, by Christ alone, not by my own, I speak in His name to tell you that your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God will provide the Lamb 
Wednesday reading is from Matthew 18. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went out and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what he had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had the mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers, until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Hello there, children. My name is Daniel. I know a lot of you I've met before, and maybe some of you I haven't, and so hello. Today is a very special day. It's unlike any other day in the calendar. It's a day that we call Ash Wednesday, and we put these ash crosses on our foreheads. They look kind of silly and kind of different, don't they? Well, did you know that Jesus didn't celebrate Ash Wednesday? And Ash Wednesday actually isn't in the Bible. What is in the Bible, though, is back at the beginning, in Genesis chapter 3, in the second part of verse 19, where it writes and says, For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. I have this black cross on my forehead to remind me that without Jesus, I'm not that special. You see, I sin, and you sin, and we do things wrong each day. The things that we think, the things that we say, the things that we do. Maybe sometimes you don't want to share Maybe sometimes you don't talk very nice. Maybe sometimes you don't listen. You see, sin is anything that puts separation between us and God. And so God the Father knew this because when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, right before uh, I read what I read in chapter 3, they ate from the fruit and they sinned and they were separated from God and their relationship was different and that caused our relationship with God to be different. And so God had a plan. He sent his son, Jesus, to the cross to die. And so we spend the next part of the church year in a season called Lent. Ash Wednesday, today, marks the beginning of that. And we journey in kind of a sad um, thought that Jesus died and suffered because of our sin. But then we get to Easter and we celebrate that Jesus rose from the grave because he loves us so much, there's nothing we can do that separates us from the love of God. So we're thankful, and we do these ashes to know that on our own we can't make it to heaven. But because of Jesus' death and resurrection, his love for us, someday we will be forever with Jesus in heaven. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross to rise, to save us from our sin. We're thankful, Lord, that you love us so much. 
Help us share your love with others, that they could know that they are forgiven of everything they do, and that they could be together with us in heaven someday. Lord, be with us during this season of Lent. We pray this in your name. Amen. What we focus on tends to shape how we see the world, what we think about, how we respond and act towards others. It can even affect what we see with our eyes. We've all experienced what psychologists call the frequency illusion, the phenomenon of noticing something more often simply because it's in the top of our minds. Uh, take, for example, if you're considering buying a new car and all of a sudden you see that exact same model all over the road. But we've also noticed the opposite effect, too, where something can hide in plain sight simply because we're not paying attention to it. We're not focused on it. Where we focus has the ability to shape how we see and respond to the world and to others around us. Now, this Lent, we're focusing in on the words of Jesus, the last seven words our Lord spoke from the cross. But in our reading from Matthew chapter 18, we see Peter is at first focused on himself. He asked Jesus a question. He says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? You see, Peter has cast himself in the role of the person sinned against, the role of the person harmed or who's been offended. And he wants to know what's the line between holding someone accountable, uh, between seeking repayment or retribution. What's the line between all of that and forgiveness? How much sin is too much? Is there a limit to forgiveness? It's a question you and I want answered too. Is there a point where we can withhold forgiveness from someone else because they've committed that sin too many times or, or the pain is too great? Or we just know that if we forgive them yet again, it's only a matter of time before they commit that sin against us yet again. But with the parable, Jesus changes Peter's focus off of himself off of how he's been heard or what he's been owed, Jesus changes Peter's focus to what he's received and to the limitless forgiveness of his king. In the opening scene of the parable, we're introduced to a king who wants to settle accounts with his servants. And there's one servant in particular who owes the king 10,000 talents of gold. Uh, scholars tell us this equates to roughly 200,000 years worth of labor. There is no way he is ever going to pay off this debt. So the king makes the only logical decision. It's time to cut his losses and protect himself from further harm. So he orders that the man's possessions be sold, uh, his family be sold into slavery, even the man himself. And whatever the king can get from the proceeds of the sale will then be used to offset the debt that he's owed. Now, this might sound shocking to us today, but this was the normal legal procedure at the time. It's what everyone expected to happen. But then the unexpected happens. The servant falls on his knees. He begs for more time and he promises to pay off the debt. It's a ridiculous promise to make. Uh, the man's problem is not simply working a little bit harder or having more time. The debt's simply too big. But the king has pity on the man and he does something even more unexpected, even more ridiculous. The king forgives the debt entirely. Uh, he doesn't give the servant more time like he asked for. He doesn't reduce it, uh, the amount of the debt or, or put him on an installment plan. He forgives the debt and lets the servant go free. It turns out that the debt isn't limitless after all, but instead it's the king's mercy and forgiveness that know no bounds. Now, it might be easy for you and me to kind of uh, dismiss this as hyperbole or, or kind of uh, an extreme example to illustrate a point. But haven't we all made a similar request to God? Asking for patience, for more time, for a chance to do better or, or to make it right. You and I, we all have sins that we've sworn to never do again and yet keep falling back into. We've made and broken more promises to God than we can remember. Uh, and in fact, it might be, have been going on for so long that you begin to wonder if you're really sorry or even worse, if God will really forgive you, if 
he'll forgive again. Or maybe this time, he's reached his limit. But you see, this little detail gets right at the heart of Peter's question. How many times should I forgive? But instead of answering Peter's question directly, Jesus changes Peter's focus off of himself and on to the king. Jesus flips the question on his head, and instead of asking, how many times should I forgive, Jesus asks, how much has your king forgiven you? And it's worth noticing who bore the cost of the debt. It was the king. Now, the king takes on the cost. He's the one who takes the hit to his bottom line, and the servant goes free. Friends, this is a story about us. Now, our king, Jesus, has paid the price of the debt we rack up every time we sin. Instead of you and me being sold into slavery, Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Instead of us having all of our possessions taken from us, Jesus was stripped of everything. Instead of you and me being separated from our family and our loved ones, Jesus was separated from his family and from his heavenly Father. All of the consequences of our sin were paid by him. And it doesn't matter how big the debt was, how many times you've asked for forgiveness, how many times you've asked for more time or an attempt to do better, there is no limit to our King's forgiveness for you. And in Jesus, you don't receive the penalty that your sins deserve, but instead, you receive something far better. You receive complete and whole forgiveness. Like the servant, you have been set free. It makes for quite the happy ending. But Jesus isn't done just yet because the king's forgiveness for you sets the model, sets the standard for how you are now to forgive others. After the servant in the parable is set free, he goes and finds a fellow servant, uh, one who owed him three months' worth of wages. It's a minuscule amount when compared to the massive debt that he was just forgiven. And the scene plays itself out all over again, except now, now the servant who has been just set free He's the one in the position to have to decide whether or not to forgive. And in a stunning display of injustice, of hypocrisy, the servant continuously refuses to forgive. It's not that he isn't able, it's that he doesn't want to. Now that it's in, to his advantage, it's in his interest to get what's owed, he refuses forgiveness to his fellow servant. And so when the word gets back to the king, the king treats this wicked servant according to his own perverted sense of justice. He has him handed over to the torturers to be kept in jail until he can pay back the debt. And the lesson of the parable is this. For the followers of Jesus, forgiveness is not an option. It's a command. It's the rule of the king for how his kingdom works and how those who belong to his kingdom must act. You and I, we, we cannot accept forgiveness when it's to our advantage and then, and then turn around and demand what's owed to us when we're the ones to bear the cost of the debt. We don't get to have it both ways. And while most of us are asked to forgive relatively minor offenses, a handful of us are called on to forgive unimaginable sins that have hurt us in unthinkable ways where even the thought to forgive immediately raises the question of how. How could I ever forgive that? How, how could I ever forgive him or her? How could I ever forgive again? I wish I had a simple answer for you. But the truth is, forgiveness is hard. It's costly. To live a life of forgiveness is vulnerable. It can feel like being taken advantage of or exposing ourselves to being harmed once again. But here's a place to start. Instead of focusing on yourself and the hurt that you have endured, instead turn your eyes and turn your focus to the king and all that you have been forgiven. You see, when you focus on yourself and how you've been wronged and whether or not you could ever forgive again, forgiveness can seem impossible. But in this parable, Jesus offers us a foundation from which forgiveness not only is plausible, but it is the only possible response. Jesus draws our focus, our attention to himself, to our king, and on his forgiveness of your debt as the source 
of your forgiveness for others. For in the cross of Jesus, the King has borne your debt, borne the cost of your sin without limit. And so this Ash Wednesday, this Lent, and for the rest of your life, focus on Jesus. Follow in his footsteps and forgive as you have been forgiven. In the name of Jesus, amen. I invite you to pause uh, the recording now uh, and discuss with those with you uh, a couple of questions. First, uh, either think about or share a time you had to forgive and answer, why is it that forgiveness is so hard? And then second, how is it that God's forgiveness for you affects your forgiveness for others? I invite you to pause the recording and discuss those questions for a moment. We now enter a time of prayer, and I want you to use this time uh, for personal prayer. So if you're by yourself, this is a time for you to, to push pause on this video and uh, to enter a time of prayer on your own. If you need something to pray for on Ash Wednesday in particular, um, pray for God's mercy. Consider your own sin as we have today and uh, turn to Him. Ask for His help in amending your sinful life. If there are uh, certain sins, particular sins, ask for the Spirit's help in uh, growing through and past those sins that God would sanctify you. And so now we enter a time of prayer. Again, if you're by yourself, on your own, if you're with a family or another person, a spouse, uh, pause the video and pray with them. You might uh, go in a circle. You might trade back and forth. You might have one person uh, pray for all of you together. So we now enter this time of prayer. We conclude together by speaking the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. We pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We came before our God in ashes. We heard of forgiveness. And now we depart not with the curse of God. We depart with his blessing, his favor upon us. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with His favor and give you His peace. Amen.
Show.